Welcome to Computer Science 4300, uh, lecture number two. So today we are starting our journey with C++, and I am super excited about that. Uh, so today I'm going to be going over an introduction to C++, and after some slides which explain all the boring details, I'm going to get into uh, some live coding. So about the first half of this lecture is going to be um, just complete intro, what is C++, and then about halfway through we're going to start some uh, live coding and I'll show you some examples of just how easy modern C++ is to use these days. Um, just to let you know up front, this lecture is going to go a few minutes long, but as I said before, um, the lectures are basically the entire material for the course. So I'm not having you go out and read a whole bunch of other textbooks and stuff like that. So it is going to go a little bit long, but if you're watching on YouTube, you can watch it at double speed or however fast, right? So that's one of the benefits of teaching online is a couple of lectures will go a little bit long just so I can fit everything um, that I want to. And an intro to C++ is going to be just a little bit longer than the, the standard hour and a bit. Okay. So let's open the slides and we will jump right into it. Let me get this uh, laser pointer up. Okay, so this is uh, lecture two for 4300. And of course we're doing an intro to game programming. And this is the first lecture out of two for, um, for the introduction to C++. So we're gonna go over basically all the C++ you need in order to make your game and pass your course and uh, do all sorts of, of fun stuff. And you may have heard in the past that C++ is kind of a nightmare to work with, but uh, modern C++ is, is quite similar to languages you've used before. It's quite safe and really, really easy to use. So here are some excellent references for C++. If after watching the lectures, you still want a little bit more, um, you can go to learncpp.com. I highly recommend that website. Uh, it's, it's really excellent. Um, there's like a step-by-step -step tutorial that takes you through learning the basics of C++. Um, en.cppreference.com. Um, if you Google anything about like C++, like file reading in C++ or STL vector or something like that, usually the first Google hit you'll get is cppreference.com. Um, an excellent reference for all of the STL and for basic C++ functionality. And there's another tutorial here on c++.com slash doc slash tutorial. And that is just um, more tutorial um, for you to get uh, as familiar as you want with C++ before the course starts. But as I said, pretty much all we'll really need to know I'll be covering in today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture. So what is C++, right? Um, before I get started on what is C++, I want to make a little bit of a quick note on the religious debate of programming languages and which language is better than another language or what's the best language or what's the worst language. Um, the, the first way to tell that someone is very new to computer science or programming is the fact that they're having that debate, okay? There is no best programming language. There is no fastest programming language. Um, think of a programming language as a tool, okay? So picture you're a carpenter and you're trying to build a building, right? If, if you're trying to build a building and you go up to someone who's really experienced and you say, what's the best tool? They're gonna laugh at you, right? Because sometimes you need a saw, sometimes you need a hammer, sometimes you need a power drill, right? And so a programming language is a tool and you are going to use the correct tool for the job. Now, it's a little bit different in that analogy in that like you can do a lot of different things with C++ or Java or Python. It's not just sawing a piece of wood, for example, but there are definitely use cases in which you would want to use C++ versus Python versus whatever. So that's just a quick note on, on the, the programming language debate and how that debate should always be framed is in the context of the thing that you're trying to do. So C++ is a programming language and it focuses on run speed and functionality. So programs that are written correctly in C++ are going to be very fast and they're going to be very functional. However, programs that are written incorrectly in C++ are going to be very slow and low functionality, okay? So you have to know what you're doing in order to get the speed out of C++. C++ is a compiled language 
and it is a mid-level programming language. So it is not a low-level programming language. I would say a low-level language is something like assembly, where you're almost writing in machine code. Um, and a high-level language would be something like Python, where you're almost writing English in some cases. So C++ is somewhere between Python and assembly. Uh, it's a compiled language. Um, so unlike Python, for example, which is interpreted, meaning that it's, it's run on the fly, line by line, C++ is compiled to machine code, and that machine code is compiled to a specific architecture and can only run on that architecture. So if you take a compiled C++ program, that will only run, say, on a 32-bit Windows machine. You can't take that executable and bring it over to another machine. However, you can take the code over most of the time, and compile it to a different architecture. So some people will say C++ is not very portable. I don't believe in that. Um, C++ is very portable if you're using the base functionality of C++. When C++ starts to become non-portable is when you're doing very specific things that are more operating system specific. Um, what are some advantages of using C++? Well, C++ is very widely used in industry. It is widely supported. And so if you go online and you ask questions, you're going to get a lot of help with C++. Uh, there are many, many libraries available for C++. We will only be using one of those libraries in this course, and that is the SFML for drawing and rendering our games. If you write C++, C++ uh, well, then the resulting code is very, very fast. Um, the syntax is going to be familiar to you. So if you've used Java or JavaScript, the syntax of a lot of things in C++ is very similar to that. Another advantage is that C++ programmers get hired. There's lots of jobs out there for C++ programmers. Um, and your code is highly customizable. Um, now that can be an advantage and a disadvantage, and we'll talk about that. So you can do lots of different things in C++ that you can't do in some other programming languages. However, with that, power comes great responsibility, right? So disadvantages. Um, it is some, it is easier in C++ to write unsafe and crashing code than it is in something like Python or Java, okay? With modern C++, a lot of the basic functionality is very, very safe and is actually kind of difficult to write unsafe code. But one of the disadvantages of C++ is, is that it's, uh, it's a little bit unsafe if you use it incorrectly. Uh, you must manage your own memory. So there is there is no garbage collector um, like there is in something like Java. Um, so you have to manage your own memory, which can be super annoying. But as you will see in this course, if you do it correctly, you can write really efficient, fast C++ code in which you almost don't have to worry about memory management at all. Okay, so while you do have to manage your own memory, there are software, um, there are C++ programming paradigms that you can use to make it so that impacts your life very little in the long run. Some compilers, it's not, this isn't so bad with more modern compilers, but some compiler errors can be very hard to, in, to interpret. And you might have like one semicolon missing and get 30 pages of errors coming out in the compiler. Uh, syntax can be a little bit confusing at times, and there's a lot of overloaded keywords like const and stuff like that, and the ampersand symbol is used in a few different places, and the asterisk is used in a few different places. So the syntax can be a little bit confusing at first, but you'll, you'll get used to it. And because C++ is so customizable, uh, sometimes it can be hard to read other people's code. Um, due to custom operator definitions or overloading and stuff like this. So if you're taking a huge unknown code base of C++, reading that C++ can be a little bit difficult sometimes if they have customized that code in ways um, that you weren't expecting. So that is a, is a real disadvantage of C++. So the story of C++, of course, it begins um, with the C programming language, which was created by Dennis Ritchie in the 70s. Um, C is available everywhere. Your toaster probably runs, runs C. Um, it's a procedural low to mid-level language. Um, there is no object-oriented programming built into C, so there's no classes or inheritance or polymorphism. C is very popular for um, system software, drivers, um, embedded software, operating systems, etc., and, and game programming as well. And it's, uh, it greatly influenced the development of C++. 
So C++ was created by Bjorn at Bell Labs, and originally it was called C with classes in, in the early 80s in its early development, but um, it has grown significantly <laughs> to be a lot more than just C with classes. But that's still the way some people think about C++, which is really not, not fair to the language. Um, you can essentially think of the C++ programming language as containing all of C. Okay, so now some purists out there will yell at me for this, but pretty much 99.99% of C programs will compile in a C++ compiler. There are some very rare exceptions. You, you wouldn't be able to pay me to come up with one. So pretty much any program that runs in C will also be compiled in C++. Okay. Um, C++ supports object-oriented programming, so it has... Um, uh, classes and, and inheritance. It also uh, supports generics. So for example, vector of ints, we'll get into that, but generics are supported via templates. It maintains uh, the efficiency of C. So the fast running code of C is maintained in C++. And because of that, it's very popular in video game development. So because it has object-oriented programming and generics and some of those modern conveniences, while maintaining the efficiency of a language like C and it's compiled to machine code, that's why it's, it's popular in game development. And the C++ heavily influenced the development of C Sharp and, and Java. I like to give some... Uh, Quotations about C++ just to scare you a little bit before I uh, before I get started. Now, all of these quotations were about like older versions of C++, like um, C++ 98 and stuff. So, writing in C or C++ is like running a chainsaw with all the safety guards removed. Okay, so um, there are more <laughs> there are more safety guards in uh, in modern C++, but you can make some uh, drastic mistakes that are very uh, difficult to debug sometimes. In C++, it's harder to shoot yourself in the foot, but when you do, you blow your whole leg off. <laughs> Actually, I made up the term object-oriented, and I can tell you I did not have C++ in mind. And uh, another one, C++ is just an abomination. Everything is wrong with it in every way, so I really tried to avoid using that as much as I could and do everything in C at Netscape. Uh, to me, the, the way I like to look at C++ is it's like... Let's say you need to go get milk, okay? You could walk to the store, you could get on your bike, you could drive a car, or you could drive a Formula One car, right? C++ is kind of like driving a Formula One car. Uh, maybe you don't want to do that to go get milk, right? If you're, if you're going a very long distance or you have to race other cars, that's when you get in the Formula One car, okay? Because if you don't drive the Formula One car correctly, the engine will blow up, and you'll be dead. So again, programming language use is contextual and you'd use C++ really when performance um, is, is your top requested feature. Um, okay, so here's another quote uh, by Linus Torvalds. If you know anything about Linus, you kind of know where this is going. And uh, so someone, uh, this this unfortunate chap wrote on the one of the Linux kernel um, forums. When I first look at the git source code, two things struck me as odd. One, pure C as opposed to C++. No idea why. Please don't talk about portability. It's BS. And then Linus responds, you are full of bullshit. C++ is a horrible language. It's made more horrible by the fact that a lot of substandard programmers use it to the point where it's much, much easier to generate total and other crap with it. Quite frankly, even if the choice of C were to do nothing but keep the C++ programmers out, that itself would be a huge reason to use C. So, you know, some people are very strongly opinionated, but maybe I'll remove these slides in the future because it's gotten a lot better since then. Uh, C++ first appeared in 1985, and there's been lots of different versions since then. C++ 98 was the real first standardized version, and a lot of these bad quotations are about C++ 98. C++ 11 was fantastic. I can't tell you how happy I was about C++ 11. Had so many new features and quality of life improvements that just made the language so much easier. Since then, there's been C++ 14, 17, and 20 is out in a lot of compilers now. For this course, um, we will be using C++ 17 since it's supported in basically every compiler now. 
So when you go to compile your programs, you have to put in this flag. Some of the features that we'll be using in this course in our code are only supported in C++ 17 and above, but we'll get to that. Um, all right. Some of these are properties of C++. C++ is statically typed. So variables are defined and typed before they're used. So unlike something like, uh, oh, I'll get into that. So for example, if I wanted an integer to store a number in C++, I would say int year equals 2018. Excuse me. Similarly, uh, Java and C are also statically typed and variable types are defined at compile time. Okay, so that means once you have an int, it can't be anything else later on. Python, on the other hand, is dynamically typed. JavaScript is dynamically typed. So you can just say num equals 10. Later on, you could assign a string to that or an object or whatever. And so in Python, variable types are defined at runtime. So that's a big difference between C++ and Python. Your first C++ program. Of course, we have to have the hello world example, right? And so this is the uh, hello world example. You include IO stream. Well, we'll talk about what all this does in the future. Then int main, int arg c, char star arg v, standard c out, hello world, return zero. Okay, what, what in the hell does that mean? But uh, we'll go through this line by line now. So the first line was include IO stream. Uh, the first line is a preprocessor directive. And we'll talk about the preprocessor later but it's a preprocessor directive. That is the type of statement that this is. Basically, it's used to include a C++ library. So you'd import something in Python or in Java. Uh, you say include IO stream here. Actually, I can't remember. Do you include or do you import in Java? It's been a while since, I, since I've done anything in Java. Um, so for example, IO stream, as you can tell, this is input output stream. And this, is partic this particular library that you're importing is used for input and output streams. So printing to the console and getting uh, data in from the user. So this in particular, most of the time, it's going to give us access to standard C out. So standard C out is how we're going to print things in a C++ way. And we'll, get, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Next we have int main, int arg c, char star arg v. So this is similar to the public static void main string args that you see in Java. So each program must have a main function, which is run when the program starts. So whatever you define in your main function, regardless of how many other functions you've written in your C++ program, it's the main function that's going to start up first. And so the contents of that function are enclosed in curly braces, just like they are in Java or in JavaScript. Um, and the main function has an integer return type. So just like Java, here's your return type up front and main is going to return an integer. Now we have two input parameters here. One is arg c and one is arg v. So arg c is the number of parameter arguments and arg v is an array of string arguments. So in Java main string args, the Java programming language lets you get the length of an array from the array itself. But in C and C++, for plain pointer-based arrays, you cannot get the length of the array from the array itself. So instead of just having string args, which is essentially what this is, you also have to have a number, which is the length of that array. And so this lets you process arguments when you run the, co when you run the command for the program um, at runtime. And we'll get into this next lecture, but char star means a pointer to a char and arg v brackets, that's denoting an array. So it's an array of character arrays, or in other words, an array of strings. The next line is standard C out hello world. And that hopefully obviously prints the string hello world to the console. So here you've got standard colon colon C out. And this is where things start getting confusing and look a little bit different to Java developers. So standard is called a namespace. And we'll talk about namespaces a bit more later. And the namespace contains the C out output stream. So C out is an object that lives in the standard namespace. The left left <laughs> operator, um, pipes the string to C out. 
So the way I like to look at this is you see here, oh, oh my camera is, is uh, covering up a bit of this, but in quotations, we have hello world, and that is getting sent to the left. That's the way I look at this sort of thing. So you're sending this string into the cout object, and that prints it to the, sc to the screen. Uh, this can be used to print any base C++ type, and each C++ statement must end in a semicolon. So this ends in a semicolon, uh, however my camera is currently in the way. And also remember that C++ is case sensitive. And the final line of the program is return zero. So the main function has a return type of int. And so what you do typically when your program executes successfully or to a normal end and it didn't crash, you're gonna return a zero. And what that does is it's going to return something other than zero if there's an error. And that return value gets returned to the console or the system and other programs that launch your program can use that return value to know whether or not uh, your program ran successfully or if it terminated in some error. So for example, maybe you have an error which is negative one means uh, I couldn't detect the file that you input or something like that. Um, so the program can run and compile without a return, but it is highly recommended to use a, contern, a return. And take a drink here. So white space in C++. Unlike Python, white space for the most part doesn't matter. So the white space in C++, as far as I know, follows the same rules as white space in Java, okay? <clears throat> so for the most part, you can have a bunch of st uh, spaces between variables, between function calls, etc., and it'll work just fine. Um, so again, you can have like int add and you can have the whole function body on the same line, or you could have like one curly bracket here and one after here, or you could have... Um, like both curly braces on the same line. White space doesn't really matter um, as long as there are spaces between variable names. Here are some exceptions. Uh, the two exceptions that are important is that strings cannot be separated by a new line. So if you want hello world, hello world has to be on the same line. Now there's a way to get around that with forward slashes, but don't get into that. Just know that you can't, this won't work. This will result in a compilation error and comments also have to be on the same line. So if you, here is a single line comment, this line comment is not part of the comment and it'll just be a compiler error. And if you want more examples of this, uh, you can go to learn CPP and uh, like lecture 16 or whatever is on white space and formatting. C++ indentation and braces. So this again is another religious debate. Um, so here up here, excuse me, is sort of the Java style of braces, uh, the K and R and variants of this. So this is often used in Java. It's used in JavaScript uh, where you have a function or you have a while loop. So at the beginning of a block of code, you define the block of code and the opening brace goes on the same line and then it will end down at the same vertical column as where you started. However, uh, the more C slash C++ way that I have been using for many, many years and therefore you will be using is the Allman style of braces where you have this and then your first opening bracket is on the next line of code. Now, I was a hurt for the first like 10 years of my programming degree or uh, I was, or my programming career, I guess you'd say, I was a KNR person until I got involved with a project that enforced the Allman style of indenting and once I started using Almond, I can't go back. Uh, having the opening and closing braces match up is like a huge visual clue to where code blocks are. Um, and and I, th for our course, we will be using that and you will be adhering to it. Now, you may think that's a little bit pedantic. Why do I care about your style? Well, you're going to have to care about the style when you go out and get a job and start contributing to a code base, right? Someone will be paying you to follow their um, conventions and their bracketing and their white space conventions and stuff. And so we're gonna do that in this course as well. And now it's not gonna be like you fail an assignment if you don't, but there'll be like 2% 
of every assignment will be like really nitpicky stuff because I want you to be a better programmer. And believe it or not, the formatting of your programs and the vis the the ability to you for you to visually debug a piece of code by looking at it um, is going to be very important in your programming careers. And so I want to start you out by making sure that there's not styles that mix. Okay, I see a question in the chat about uh, namespace standard and stuff. I have a slide about that, so I won't uh, answer that right now. So, the C++ standard library. The standard template library is a collection of classes and functions that are available within the C++ language. So some example functionality, this all comes with C++, which is really great. You have strings, input output, streams, files, uh, generic containers, so you have vectors, sets, maps, you have container functionality, so you can fill a vector, you can copy a set, you can erase stuff from a map. You have some algorithms, so you have sorting, minimum, maximum, some math functionality, all sorts of stuff built into the standard library for you already. So, if you want to use the standard library, you have to do the include preprocessor directive in your program. Um, and anything within the standard library is referenced via the standard namespace. So again, just as an example, um, namespaces just encapsulate code. They are a way to organize your code. So if you have a library, um, you can put all of the functionality and all of your variables and all of your classes from that library into a namespace, which will make it easier for people using your library to use it. So that's what is that what that's what std colon colon is. So for example, if I came out with my own library and I wanted to call it the Dave library, so I would say namespace Dave, and then within brackets, I would put whatever I want. Okay. Let's say I just have an int variable Ivar equals 10. Outside of that namespace, if I, in, in someone's code who has included my library, the Dave library, if they want access to this Ivar variable, then they would say Dave colon colon Ivar because it's inside the Dave uh, um, namespace and colon colon is how C++ lets you get access to things inside namespaces and, and classes. So just like Dave Ivar, there is a standard namespace, okay, STD, uh, some people say std, some people say std, I say standard. Um, well, I, I go back and forth, actually. And so inside the std namespace, there's something called cout, and so that's what you're referring to when you print something. So some really common library examples, we have standard string, standard vector, standard map, etc. Okay. Program code is written in CPP files, for C++. So in Python, you have a .py file. In Java, you have a .java file. In C++, you have a .cpp file. So for example, um, you have main.cpp, you compile main.cpp, and you run your executable. Uh, now, the thing is, the file extension doesn't really matter. That's not what the compiler is looking for but it's a convention used by C++ programmers. I've also seen .capital C, I've seen .capital CPP, but in this course, we're going to be using .cpp. In addition to CPP files, there are header files, okay? So an example might be math.h, myclass.h, and while the CPP files are used for code definitions, Header files are used for function and class declarations. And I'll show an example of this later, okay? But there is a difference and they matter. Now we'll talk about how we compile programs. So C++ programs are compiled into binary executable files that are run directly on your CPU. So there's no virtual machine, there's no Java virtual machine, there's no Python interpreter. Your compiled programs are running right on the hardware. And this results usually, if the program is written correctly, at, with faster execution. But the price that you pay for faster execution is that the level of programming that you do is usually a little bit lower, okay? So that means you're going to have to specify more things, man manage your own memory, etc. And there are many different C++ compilers um, for different operating systems. Some of the more popular ones are GCC, there's Clang, um, 
there's uh, Visual Studio, so MSVCC. Uh, those are the three main ones. There's MinGW for Windows as well. Um, my make files that I'm including with this course are gonna be using G++, but I'm also gonna be giving you Visual Studio project files. And I'll be talking about Visual Studio when I give out the first assignment. So if you're on Windows, don't go out and install your own compiler. Install Visual Studio. I will be giving out Visual Studio project files and I will be giving a full Visual Studio tutorial on how to use that um, as we get to the first assignment. Okay, so what is the process for, for which, what's the process that a, that a C++ program goes through to get from source code to an executable file? Now, it's not completely necessary to know all of this. And actually, let me turn off the camera for a sec, or I'll move it over here. All right. Um, it's not necessary to know all of this in exact detail, but like you do want to know the difference between like a preprocessor error, a compiler error, and a linker error, and a runtime error, because they're all different types of errors, right? So we'll go through this uh, really quick. So at first, source and header files. So here at the start, you have some source files. This is this was written for C, but it's the same for C++. So that's why you see .c. For us, this will be .cpp. So you have some source files and header files. Those are fed into the preprocessor. So the preprocessor does things like include. So whenever you include a file, it just copies and pastes it into your file. Um, the preprocessor output is called an expanded source file. And then that expanded source file is run through the compiler. And at that point, there will be, if there's a compiler error, if you type something wrong, it'll stop. If there's no compiler error, then object files are created. So object file, you can think of, if you have many different CPP files, each one of them will create their own object file. And then object files are all linked together to form the final executable file. Okay, now all this is done for you behind the scenes by um, the compiler if you want it to, but also you can break this down into individual steps and have complete control over it. So there are several popular compilers. I've already uh, mentioned a couple of these. For Linux and Mac, I would recommend the GNU C, C compiler. So it's GCC for C or G++ for C++. There's Clang as well or Clang++. In Windows, there's MinGW. We're not using MinGW in this course. We will be using Visual Studio for Windows. And the same code that we write will, will compile in Linux, Mac, or Windows. And that's one of the, the cool things about C++ and, um, and SFML is that it's a completely cross-platform. So, oh, this was back when there was no pandemic, so you could ignore this. Um, run it however you want. Um, this was back when we had lab machines up and running. So Visual Studio does the same thing that I described before with all the different steps, but it does it behind the scenes. And its project files hide a lot of the details, but just know that all that is going on behind the scenes when you hit compile and run. Uh, it's just hidden from you. So, but it's, it's still, even though all that is hidden from you, if you want to be a better programmer, you need to be a better debugger and you need to know this whole process, right? So it's important to know the whole process and the command line steps to give, get everything up and going. So C++ compiling. Let's say that we have a program and it's written in myprog.cpp. Okay, I'll move myself back over there. So to compile this program, I can type g++ myprogram.cpp and that's going to produce an executable file and by default for some reason that's called a.out um, and then you can run that executable now this is this is in linux and, and a mac um, visual studio won't do this um, but if we want to we can specify the output file name with g++ so if i say g++ myprogram.cpp dash o then this will be, the argument to dash O will be uh, the name of the executable that's up and running. So if I want to run my program here, I can run my program. And that's just a better name than, than a.out. Um, if I want to do something let, like, let's say, uh, look at the results of the preprocessor, I can say g++ dash E, my program, to myprogram.s, and that will be the, um, the expanded source file. 
I can compile my program to an object file without going through the linker into an executable if I want. So the dash C flag will do that. And then I can link my individual objects together if I want to into a single executable by hand by invoking the linker, okay? But we don't need to do all of that. We hide all of this stuff in make files and project files and stuff like that. So if we want to, multiple CPP files can be compiled in a single step. So if we don't wanna to have to go through all of these steps, what we can do is we can say g++ star.cpp, so compile all of my CPP files into this one program. Um, and this will not generate the intermediate.o files in the directory. However, um, it will recompile every CPP file every time. And so since linking is much faster than compiling, a lot of the time what we want to do is we don't want to type in this command. We only want to compile files that have changed since the last time we compiled, right? So we generate new object files if their CPP files have changed since the object files were created. So this can be done with a make file, and I've included a make file with the assignments, and I'll go over the make file at another time. It's a bit more advanced than we want to look at right now. And all this stuff is automatically done with Visual Studio. Okie dokie. Uh, I see some questions in the chat. They're not extremely relevant to what I'm talking about, so I'll skip over them for now. Uh, so this C plus, the G++ preprocessor function, um, it runs all the preprocessor directives. So again, these are preprocessor directives. So the most popular preprocessor functions are including a library, including a specific file, or making macros that we can use in place of variables sometimes when we may need one. So when we say include a specific library or include myobject.h, this will literally take that file, copy the text from it and place it where you had that line, okay? So that's what the preprocessor does. And that whole process um, is, is here and yeah, that, that's the whole process of, of compiling a C++ program. Um, let me, I, I got to look at my, okay, I'm going to go over a couple of more slides and then we'll get into the, uh, the live programming. So the live programming is a little bit uh, less boring. Uh, you can point out any errors that I make and stuff like that, but let's just get through a few more slides. Sometimes, no, I'll, I'll come back to this, actually. I think I'll come back to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to this stuff. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go... That's enough slides. We're going to go do some live programming to show you what all this stuff is about. Okay. Here we go. So here I've got a terminal. Uh, this is a terminal into a Linux machine. So I've just got a, a directory here set up and there's just one file in the directory that's student.txt. So if I just look at what that students is, I've got some fake data for fake students that we're going to end up some, somehow working with. So let's uh, use Vim and we're just going to write a say lecture.cpp and here we are. We are now editing our first C++ file. So this is going to be a long journey through through C++, but each journey has a first step, right? So here here we're uh, we're going. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to include IO stream because I want to be able to use uh, C out to print something to the stream to the to the to the console. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, then I'm going to have int main, and I'm I'm doing this without any references, by the way. So uh, give me a break if I make a little bit of a mistake. So we have int main, then we have int arg c, that's the count of arguments, char star arg v, and that's the array of strings. In here, we are going to return zero um, when our program runs successfully. And we've got the almond style braces, okay? And what we're gonna do here for our first program, of course, is standard c out, hello world. 
and then we're going to have a new line character bam so that's going to print out hello world now i am going to write and quit to save that file so if i look at the contents of that file that's what it is and now i can type g plus plus lecture.cpp it compiles it if i look at my directory now i have this a.out file and so i can run a.out and it says hello world Okay, now I'm going to remove a.out and I'm going to compile the program. So g++ lecture.cpp and I'm going to say dash o lecture. So what this is going to do is it's going to create an executable called lecture instead of um, an executable called a.out. So if I look now, I have this lecture executable in green. So I can type dot slash lecture to run lecture and there we go. So let's go back um, <clears throat> into our program. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a little bit of an error, okay? So let's say I made a typo here, and instead of C out, I say CO3 out or something like that. Well, I'm going to save the file and quit again, and I'm going to try and compile my program again. So here I'm gonna compile it, and now you get um, a compiler error okay so here I'm just this this was a bit high up so I just moved my camera for a second so a compiler error is uh, here we see in main so it says uh oh there's an error it's on line 6 character 10 of that program so it prints out line 6 for me and it says here's the error and look this compiler is so um, so smart, it says, did you mean C out? And yes, I did mean C out. So I would go back and I would fix it. Now, not all um, C++ error messages are that nice, but just to show you, that's what's gonna, excuse me, that's what's going to happen if you do type an error. All right, so that process of me saving the file and then exiting back out and compiling it and running it, that's going to be a pretty long process. So what I've done is inside Vim, I've made a hotkey. And when I hit the hotkey, it saves, compiles, and then if the program compiles successfully, it runs it. If it doesn't, it prints the, the, the thing for me. So just watch. If I go back in here and I have a different um, error message and I run it, so S STSD has not been declared. So that means I'm using something that it doesn't know about. It hasn't been declared. So I just wanted to show you that um, that's what my hotkey is doing. Whenever you see it disappear like that, um, that's what's going to happen. Someone asked, why am I using a terminal? Uh, the reason I'm using a terminal is because all I care about right now is showing you um, parts of the C++ programming language and the compiler in a manual sort of process. I don't want to include any IDEs or anything like that. This is just a text editor and a command line that lets me compile and run the basics of the program. Okay, now someone asked before about using namespace standard. So this is another one of those debates that some people um, are super picky about. What you can do Whenever you are using things from a namespace, so std colon colon, up here, I could tell my program, I could tell the compiler, is the compiler or preprocessor? I'm not sure. But I can say using namespace standard, okay? And what that will do is whenever I type something like C out, that is not an already declared variable, the compiler now knows to use namespace standard to see if it lives there first. So if I compile and run this program, it'll say hello world, okay? Now, the only hard and fast rule that I ever have when it comes to using whatever is you never, ever, ever use namespace standard inside a header file, okay? For dummy programs like the one I'm writing, it's fine, however, I like to be very specific um, about where my things are coming from, okay? So for this course, we are not going to be using namespace standard. The reason is it's just a couple of characters 
And this gives us complete control. And at a glance, I can see that, okay, they're using standard Cout, they're using standard vector, etc. So we are not going to be using namespace standard in this course, and that will lose you a couple of marks on an assignment. Okay, so now we've printed out a hard-coded string, let's look at some variables in C++. Well, this is pretty easy. It's just like most other typed programming language. So if I want to say int year equals 2021, I can come down here and I can uh, standard C out. Now, what if I want to print out multiple things? Okay. Well, what I can do is I can say the year is, now I'm not going to have a new line there, but I'm going to print out standard C out uh, year. And then I want a new line. So if you want to print a new line in C++, um, there's a kind of a little bit of annoying thing. So I can just print a new line character and that's fine. However, when you're writing to files, for some reason, Windows and Linux have different new line characters for files. So slash N is the Linux and Mac new line character. Windows expects a carriage return and then a new line. So if you never ever want to have to worry about that, the ultra safe way is to insert the end line character and your compiler, which is specific to your operating system will know which new line character to insert, okay? So if you really wanna be pedantic about it, you can put in standard ENDL, but I won't have the space for all that. So I'm just going to print it out this way. So we're printing out the year is with no new line. So on the same line, it should print out the year and we see the year is 2021. But this is going to be super cumbersome to have to do like print statements for each variable. So what you can do is you can just keep piping in more stuff. So I can just say the year is, and then the year variable, and then my new line character, and just print it out all in the same line, okay? Similarly, I could say um, the year is year plus 100, and then that will be uh, returned. So there we go. Now, I think there might be an error if I do something like this, it may not be. No, okay, so that's fine as well. I don't need to encapsulate that in brackets. All right, so that is an integer variable. What about a string variable? Well, luckily we have a standard string just for that. So let's say I have a, a first, standard string first, and standard string last, okay? And I'm gonna declare this to be uh, Dave, and last is going to be equal to Churchill. Oh no, I, is my stream lagging? Because the terminal is lagging and that's gonna suck if that keeps up. Um, no, it's fine, okay. Ah, oh, this is gonna suck. This is like live. Uh, so this terminal is actually running on the university server. So, yes, I am on Garfield, and this kind of sucks. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna keep pressing along here. Standard C out first, and then this, and then last. Oh dear. All right. So here we go. All right. So I got a good error message here, missing a terminating character. You guys should have told me that I was missing the terminating character. So here I'll put in that uh, quotation mark and I'll recompile and run and it prints out my name. Okay, someone someone got it, you missed the end quotes, perfect. So hope, hopefully this lag doesn't continue. Uh, I'll do this on a local terminal uh, next time, but I have all this set up right now. So those are strings and I can do addition on strings if I want to. So for example, I could say standard string um, full name equals first plus a space plus last. And then I could print that out if I wanted to. Okay, so that compiles and runs, perfect. Okay. Now I want to show you something that if you've never used C or C++ before is going to be new to you. So let's declare a function. So I'm going to make a really simple function and this function is going to be get num um, and it's just going to return the answer to the universe and everything, right? So this function is just going to return a number 42 for random purposes. 
Now what I can do down here, let's say I want to print out um, the return of that function, then I can just say standard cout get num slash n, right? And I can compile and run it and we print out 42. Okay, so that's not new to you. However, in C and C++, uh, let's put this at the end of the program instead of at the beginning of the program. So watch this. Uh-oh. Get num was not declared in this scope. So line six, get num. What does that mean? Okay. So C++ and C, its compilers go from the top to the bottom. And if you try and use something that you have not yet declared, it just says, nope, I don't know what this is. God forbid I look a little bit further and see the get num afterwards, but it can't, okay? Java will let you do this. JavaScript will let you do this. Python will let you do this. But in C and C++, you cannot do that. So it's going to be super annoying <laughs> if we have to type all of our programs or all of our functions that we want to use above us in the file somewhere, right? So what we can do here is we can declare the functionality of the function without defining the function. So a function declaration would look like this. It's just the signature of the function without the body, okay? So what I am telling the rest of my code from here on is that I will have a function called getNum. It takes no parameters and it returns an integer. So when the compiler now goes through and it sees get num, it knows, oh, I see. Okay, so get num is a function that takes no parameters and returns an int. I can compile it now. And then when it goes to run, it will find this code in the object file and be able to, to use that code. So now this will run, okay? So what happens when we include stuff is like the following. So let's quit out of this for a second. Now I'm going to have uh, another file, which is just like myfunks.h. And in here, I'm going to have int, um, what was that called? Get num. And this is gonna return 42, right? So this is defined in its own header file. I'm going to quit out, then go back to lecture and delete all of this code. And now, oops. <laughs> if I want access to those functions I've written, I can include myfunks.h. And what include literally does is take the contents of myfunks.h and paste it in right there. Okay? So that will mean now that I can compile and run the program and hit it has access to that get num function. Uh, someone says, does this, does this feature make it faster than others or just a different way of working? I would say that uh, this drastically reduces compile times by not having to do those sort of loops and look over everything multiple times. So it's a little bit annoying for the programmer, but it probably dramatically reduces the compile times. Okay. Now, one more thing about functions, and uh, actually, I'm gonna save I'm gonna save that thing till the next lecture, so don't worry about it. Uh, okay, let's look at classes now. So, how would I define a class in C++? Well, it's very similar to how you would define a class in Java, except in Java, when you when you uh, have a class, it has to be in its own file. Okay, I have to have a class and I have to be in its own .java file. None of that is true whatsoever for C++. So let's look at a class student. And there we go. Now I have a class student. I can use that class if I want to. Um, now it, it doesn't do much as of right now, but that is a, that's how you declare a class in C++. In C++, you're going to declare um, parts of your class. Now I'm not going to go into object oriented programming because you should know that already. This is a fourth year course, but you do have to declare whether things are public 
or private in your classes, okay? So within my class, if I have, um, oh yeah, sorry, that's not, this is how you declare it, not, not what I had before. Thank you, chat, you're on the ball. I mean, I made that uh, error intentionally to see if you were still awake. So everything I type here will be private. Everything I type down here will be public. Different people have different ways that they like to arrange this sort of thing. Um, one other little thing is that if you do not declare any visibility, then by default, it's private. So if I come in here and I say standard string um, first equals Dave, okay, then that string by default is private because it has not been declared everything. And that's kind of what I like doing. I like having my privates up on the top. Some people like having their privates on the bottom. Insert uh, jokes here, you know. So I'm gonna have um, a couple of things in here for student. So standard string last equals Churchill. All right, uh, what else can I have in here? Let's have a student number. So my student number is going to be, and again, white space doesn't matter. So I'm going to call this um, uh, student ID. So SID equals, um, and that can have some value. So we'll call it zero. Now, my student isn't always going to be me, right? So I'm just going to declare these as empty strings. And you actually don't need to. These are empty strings by default, but I'm going to leave it there by completeness, for completeness. The, the really important thing here is that in modern C++, you can declare initial values of variables right up here in the class definition, which is really, really nice. Uh, let's say I also have a uh, grade. So my grade by default is going to be zero. So a student is going to have a first name, a last name, a student ID, and a grade. Now, I'm a big stickler, as you can see, for, um, for syntax and, and code visibility. And something I like to do for all of my private member variables, I put M underscore in front of them. And this might seem a, a bit verbose at first, but it, it, really, it really does help you in the long run to have a prefix for member variables in a program. Now you may not have seen that before, but what it does is it lets you see instantaneously Whenever you see M underscore in front of a variable, you know that that variable is a private member variable belonging to this class. And when you have really complex code, that ends up helping you. Okay, so now down here, uh, we want to have a public constructor for student so that, you know, you can actually construct a student. So this is how you make a constructor for a student. Um, now, the, this is called, what's called a default constructor. So it will just make a student and not really do anything else for it. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But something else that I might want to have uh, in a student class uh, is, is that these values right now are private, right? So I want to have like some sort of way to return, to return these values so I can get them from the outside. So let's say I have a standard string or a function to get first name. Okay. So let's say we call this one get first. Now I might have it get first name. Um, if I was really get first name would be a better name, but I'm trying to save on space here on the screen. So get first, and this will return M first. Then down here, standard string, um, get last, and this will return M last. Now we're going to have um, int and this is going to be get ID. Okay, so return M ID or SID or get SID. Let's go with that student ID. And then we'll have int get grade and this will be return M grade. All right. So very similar syntax to something like classes in JavaScript or a Java for this, except there's no this dot. Okay. So you don't need this dot by default. You could, you can actually say this, this is a pointer and we're getting into pointers in the next lecture. So you can specifically refer to this if you want to in C++, but by default, it, it looks at this. So you don't need to have it. Okay. 
So typically we're going to want to construct a student with, you know, the name and stuff like that. So how would we do that? Well, we're going to have a constructor here, which is going to actually pass in all of those values. So we have a, str a standard string first, standard string, last, int id, int grade, okay? And then what we could do in here, like we had with Java, would be say m first equals first, m last equals last, m s id equals id, and m grade equals grade. Okay, so you see how those uh, prefixes are already coming in handy, right? Like if I if I just call these first last SID grade, and then I wanted to call these first last ID and grade, like how would I choose my variable names there? I'd have to have like first in or something like that, and it would get really weird. So let's just let's just compile this for now. Okay, I I luckily haven't made any errors so far, but I do have the base functionality of a student. Let me put one more function on a student, and I'm going to call this uh, print, okay? So I'm going to print, and what this is going to do is I'm going to standard C out uh, M first, oops, M last, M SID, M grade, now that's going to word wrap, so apologies for that. And then a new line. So I'm going to be able to just use this to really easily print out um, the values of a student so that I can do that uh, in a timely manner for this class. Let's see if I made any errors there. No. Okay, so now that we have this student class, let's use a student somehow, right? All right. So here, let's get a student. We're going to say student S. And the way that we construct an object on the stack, and the next lecture is going to all be about pointers, references, heap, and stack, okay? So this is a stack alloca allocated object. You'll know what that is next time. We're going to pass it in as the arguments. Dave, Churchill, um, what is my student ID? Well, let's say it's just 2001. That's all you need to know about how old I am. And... Um, my grade is going to be a uh, 79. Okay, that's what I that's what the grade that I got. Then I'm going to say s.print. And so this should construct a student. Excuse me. Dave Churchill with these values and then I'm going to print out those values. Oh my god, thank thank god it worked, right? So that is how you use classes. And if you've done any programming with any other programming language, that should be that should be fine. Uh, let me show you something that is different than Java or JavaScript. And that is, uh, should I leave that till next time? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, let me show you what a, what a destructor is. Okay. So I'm going to standard C out constructor. So what this does is whenever I construct a new object, it prints out constructor. When an object gets destructed in C++, I may want to do some things to it. So what I'm going to do here is show you an example. By default, you don't need a, constru a destructor. But if you want to manually define one, you can, okay? Yeah, so someone just said, oh my, learning C++ is a first language. This is nobody's first language here in this course. This is a fourth year computer science course. If I was teaching this as a first language, this would be like lecture three, okay? So people are assumed to have a bit of knowledge. So now when I run the program, here's what happens. I'm going to construct a student. It's going to print out that student's information. And then... When the end of the block scope, so the block of code that I'm in, whenever this reaches its next curly brace, okay, that is when the lifetime of the object is going to end. So any stack allocated variables are destroyed at the end of its block of scope. So that means 
after return zero happens, the S is going to be destructed. And that's what we see when we run the program. The constructor happens, everything gets printed out, and then the destructor gets called. Now, that's a little bit confusing, but we're going to learn that uh, more in the next lecture. Okay. I want to say just a little bit about uh, this first. This passing of variables into a constructor and then manually setting them like this is not the preferred way of doing things in C++. What we actually want to do is what's called a initializer list. And the syntax for the initializer li list is as follows. So we're going to say first gets the value of first or m underscore first. This is just my syntax for doing this. So you can say uh, m last gets the value of last. m sid gets the value of, uh, is that capitalized? No, it's not. This gets the value of I id and then m grade gets the value of grade. So what this does is if I had not used an initializer list, all of my initial values would have been assigned first and then overwritten by the values that I assigned inside the constructor. By using an initializer list, that initial initialization <laughs> of all the values doesn't happen. And so this is just an optimization so that you're not doubling up on the initialization of everything. So always use initializer lists whenever you're trying to assign values. With initializer lists, I like to use this syntax to make it a little bit cleaner, easier to read. Um, I like doing this, just clean it up a little bit because uh, I like vertical columns of data, um, like your code, like a spreadsheet. I, I like that sort of thing. So this will still work. It'll produce the exact same uh, values. I just deleted the destructor. Alrighty, so we have our class student, and now let's do something more interesting with it. Uh, let's make a vector of students, okay? So if I want to have a collection of something, the default way that we're going to uh, be doing collections of things is a vector, because vectors are great. Um, you should have learned about vectors in another class, but a vector is just basically a managed array that we can add stuff to, um, and, and delete things from. So here I'm going to have a vector and that's going to be called students, okay? So let's go through this manually at first. So I'm going to create uh, two students, S1 and S2. This is going to be Dave2 and Dave Churchill2. And then I'm going to have um, students.push back S1, students.push back s2. So what we're doing here, if we're going to create a vector called students, we're going to create some students, then we're going to push those students back into the vector. So just to show that all of that has worked correctly, we are going to iterate through our array or our vector of students, and we're going to, um, we're going to print out the information of all the students in the vector. Okay. So there's a couple of ways iterate through the students vector. A couple of ways that we can do that. Uh, I'm going to show you two of them. The first way you're probably very familiar with. Okay, so I can say for int i equals zero, i is less than students dot size in C plus plus. The vector is dot size i plus plus. I can refer to the current student by saying students i dot print. Okay, so this is very similar to Java syntax. I'm going through for int i equals zero, i less than students dot size, i plus plus. I'm getting the ith element from that vector and then I'm printing it. So let's see if this works. Okay. Oh, it says vector is not a member of standard. So what that means is I did not include vector. So if I want to include vectors, I have to include vector up at the top. If I run it now, oh dear. Okay. 
Let's see if this works. Give me one second. I don't want to explain that message just yet. Ah, oh dear. Give me one second. No matching function call for push back student reference. Yeah, thank you to the chat. Another another intentional mistake. There you go. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, let me delete this because I'll go back to it later. Okay, so here we got a warning. So thank you to people in the chat for pointing out that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a demonstration of a 30-page error message for something really, really simple. Um, however, when it comes to getting template arguments incorrect, that is when you're going to get a 30-page error message. Anything to do with templates, you're going to have a nightmare of an error message. I think Clang is a little bit better, um, but anyway, we'll stick with this. So what did that warning message say? It said, warning, comparison of integer expressions of different signedness, int and size type. So uh, basically what we did was we compared an, a signed integer to an unsigned integer. And that's not something that we want to do. And so whenever we want to deal with unsigned ints in C++, especially when counting, I'm going to use a size type. So I could have said unsigned int. However, unsigned int is of different sizes on different architectures or whatever. So I'm going to use size t. And what size t ensures is it's C++'s type that ensures it's of the same length of the memory of your system. So on my 64-bit architecture, this is going to be 8 bytes <clears throat> or 64 bits. Yes, same thing. Um, if it was a 32-bit machine, this would be 4 bytes, etc. So let's do it now and we no longer have that warning messages because we are we are uh, comparing a unsigned integer to an unsigned integer. And we see here, we do iterate through the vector and we get all of our students in the vector. Okay, the second way that we can iterate through this vector is called a range-based for loop, okay? So here we can say for s in students. There we go. So this goes through every student in the vector and it's going to do the same thing. Oh, I need to put in auto. So for student S in students, I've been using, I've been using too much uh, Python recently. So for student S in students, print them all out. Okay. I was not declared in this scope, of course. S.print. So it goes through students looks at each value in students, assigns it to s, and then prints out s, okay? There we go. So that worked. However, as we will see in the next lecture, when we talk about um, pass by value, pass by reference, this is actually creating a copy of each student in the vector and then assigning that copy to s. So what we really want to do is say for references to students, S in students, okay? And we're going to get more into that, like I said, but similarly, and no one pointed this out, we're going to want to pass in references to these strings here so that we're not copying them, okay? And it turns, <laughs> turns out that we're actually going to be wanting to pass in const references to strings as well. We'll get into this in the next lecture, so let's not worry about it too much, but this should all still work out fine. Okay, that's a little optimization that will end up mattering in the long run, and we'll get into that. Um, yeah, so some people are saying, ooh, there's a space on both sides of the reference. Some people do this, some people do this. I've I've grown up with code bases like this. I'm gonna leave it like this for now. Um, you, can, you can talk to me about it later. Alrighty. Huh. So, let's say now that we want to do a little bit more object-oriented way of organizing this vector of students, okay? So what might you call 
a group of students. Well, we may call that a course. So let's look at a course. There's people in the chat right now asking about like um, getters and setters and references and stuff. We're building up to that, okay? I'm just showing you how to use classes at this point. I'm not getting into const correctness or reference correctness or all that kind of stuff. We will get there, trust me, but I have to start somewhere. So inside a course, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my vector of students. So as a private variable, I'm going to have a standard vector of student called m students. So that's my students. That's what's going to be in this course. Maybe my course is going to have a standard string uh, m name. So maybe that would be like 4300, for example. So then I would have a public constructor. I like putting public over here. So my course is going to take in a const standard string reference, which is the name of the course when I go to construct one. And I am going to use an initializer list to say m name equals name, or not equals, m name name. And so that is going to set up my course constructor. Now, maybe I want to add a student to this course, okay? So how would I add a student to the course? Well, maybe I have a function, which is add student. Now, again, I don't want this um, student to be changed and I want to pass it by a reference. So I would say const student s. And then I would, if I want to add that to my vector, sorry, my VI uh, tabbing is incorrect, m students dot push back s. So this is going to take an input student and it's going to add it to the vector of students. The last thing I may want to do on a course is get all the students, right? So I could say, well, I want the return type to be a standard vector of students, get students, and this will return m students. Okay, semicolon missing. Thank you again to the chat. So this is the base functionality of a course, all right? Now, yes, I realize that there are things that I have not done yet, but the whole point of teaching is to tell a story, right? And the, the, the beginning of the story is that you're bad. The middle of the story is you get better. <laughs> and the end of the story is you get good, right? So we're not good yet, we're, we're, we're still bad. So what I'm gonna do, uh-oh, I want those students to still be there. Instead of having a vector of students, I'm going to have a course called um, comp4300. And then that is going to have a string name called comp4300. Perfect. I'm going to have student one and student two. And this time, instead of adding them to a vector, I'm going to say comp43. Ah, I'm going to say this is C just to cut down on it. So that's my course C, C dot add student S1 and C dot add student S2, okay? Now, instead of iterating through the vector that I had there, now what I have to do is say get students or C dot get students. So what this will do is it will get the array, the student array inside the course, and then it will iterate through all of them. So let's see if I've made any big errors here. No, okay, so I have the exact same functionality. It's just a little bit nicer code, right? All right. I say I'll write a lot. Sorry, I, I know. What have I done wrong here? This is where the Java and the uh, JavaScript developers and the Python developers get a little bit tripped up. By default, if you return something without specifying it as a reference or as a pointer, it's going to copy it and then return it. So what happens down here, if I get the students, okay, it's going to return a reference, or sorry, it's going to return a copy of that student vector. So let me just show you an example of this. 
I'm going to write this function up here. So I'm going to have a function inside my course, which is print. And what this is going to do is going to say for, uh, now I could say for student reference s in m students, s dot print. However, what someone in the chat said earlier is that if I'm lazy and I don't want to specify what the type is, I can say auto s. So auto s will automatically infer the type from what I'm looping through, which is a vector of students. So this is essentially the same thing as typing student. So now I can type um, the vector dot print. So let's do this. What we're going to do is we are going to get standard vector uh, student, or I'm going to say auto, <laughs> auto students equals C dot get students. Then I can see, or students dot print, and we'll see, does this work? Error, standard vector student has no member print. Oh, I see. I don't want this. I just want to say C dot print, my apologies. So this is going to print out all the students in the course. There we go. So we've printed out the students in the course, uh, which is what we wanted. All right. After we print out the course, let's say we get the students. Okay. Um, no, I'm going to... Uh, I don't need to go through this example. But what I'm trying to say here is that this is going to return a copy of this vector. And that's not what we want. I'm going to have like... 20 minutes devoted to this in the next lecture. So I'll just say for now, we want to return a reference to the returned vector. And what that's going to allow us to do is not create a copy of the whole student vector every time we return. Usually we may even want to return a const reference to those students. Um, and we'll get into const correctness later in the course as well and why that matters. But I don't want to overload you with that stuff right now. This will work just the same already. So we've gone through like creating classes, creating functions on those classes. Um, here's something we can do as well, which is really cool that Java can't do. Okay. Um, someone asked reference is faster than copies. Yes, because you're just looking at a pointer versus copying the whole thing. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to get into that next course. I can define my own custom operators in C++. So this is actually really neat. Let's say I want operator uh, void operator. Uh, uh, am I going to do that? Let's see if this works. Void operator. Uh, we'll do operators next time. It's fine. I don't, I don't need to do that right now. Sorry, I keep going back and forth, but I, I want to keep this a little bit shorter and I have one more thing to do. So right now what we're doing is we are manually creating students and we are manually adding them to the course and then we are printing them out. However, that's really not how we would be looking at actual course data, right? So what I have out here, um, if I quit out of this, is I have a file called students.txt. And inside this file, I have a bunch of student data, one per file. So I have David Churchill, student number and grade. Joe Smith, student number, grade. Santa Claus, student number, grade. Easter Bunny, student number, grade, et cetera, et cetera. I want to show you how easy it is to read data from files in C++. And when it's simple data like this, I would say that C++ is the easiest language to read in values. And I'll show you why. So let's go back to our lecture. Now what we're going to do is we're going to remove all this stuff. And we're going to add a function to our course. And this is going to be add students from file. And this is going to take in a file name. Okay. So add students from file. Whenever we call that, 
we're going to be able to pass in a file name to a file of students. And in order to use some file reading, I am going to have to include fstream, which is the file stream packet or a library in the STL. So how do I open a file to start reading values in C++? Well, that is going to be an input file stream, if stream. I'm going to call that fin for file in. And then the constructor of that file input stream is going to be file name. That's it. I've already set up the, the file reader. And that's just standard if stream fin file name. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up some variables that I'm going to read the different things into, okay? So I'm going to have a standard string. Uh, this is going to be the first name and the last name. Just like Java, I can declare multiple variables on the same line. And I'm also going to have int id and int grade, okay? So these are the variables that I can read into. Now, of course, Ideally, what you should be doing is giving all of your variables a default value like this. But since I know that I'm going to be um, putting values into these, it's not such a big deal. So I can just say um, int id grade. I'm not going to be using these before I assign them a value. And I just want to keep this all on the same screen, but normally I would give them default values. So what I can do now is I can read from the file into those variables. How would I do that? Well, instead of the left shift operator where I'm sending data to a stream, like, so for example, standard cout 42, right? That sends 42 into the output stream. The way I like to look at this is I can take the input stream and send it into a variable. Look at that. So I can go f in first, f in last, f in id, f in grade. Now, what this does is in C++, this, this operator skips spaces and goes to the next token. So it does tokenizing and converting for you to base C++ types automatically. And so this is actually going to read in from that, that file. It's going to say, okay, the first string I find is the first name. The second string I find is a last name. Then it's going to find an integer and another integer. So what we can do here is we can say um, student s and put it in first, last, id, grade. And now we've got our um, student created, right? And then I can say add student s because I've already got a function on this object called add student. So why don't I add student? Similarly, what I could do is instead of creating a variable, I could just say add student, student, and then construct it in place just like that. So what this does is it, it reads in that first line, all those values, creates a student, and then adds that student to this course. So let's have a look at that. And let's go down here. We're going to create our comp 4300 course. We're going to say c.add students from file. And we're going to say students dot text because that's the file that I have. And let's see the errors that I made. Oh my God, it worked. Can you imagine typing a program and just having it work? So what that did is it, oh, wait a minute. What's wrong here? What did I do? Right? I only read the first student from the file, but there were a bunch of different students in that file. So what I could do, right? Is, is if I know there's four students in the file, well, I could just duplicate this code four times adding students. But of course we don't wanna do that. We want to have a for loop, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a while loop here because I don't need four's big declarations. So what am I gonna do here? How am I gonna know when the program stops reading data? 
right? Because I'm going to read more data, more data, more data. Um, and then at some point, it's going to be the end of the file. Well, there's lots of different ways to do that. So you could say like you could detect EOF, you could say while fin.good, but there's a better way to do this for this specific use case, at least. When you use this pipe operator, okay, when I go fin first, okay, when I say fin first, if that reaches the end of the file, that will return false. Well, technically what it does is fin gets converted to a null pointer, which evaluates to false. And if there is something left in the file, it will evaluate to true. But what I can do is say, okay, let's use our brains here while fin first. Okay, so what does this do? It says, try to read something from the file, store it in the variable first. Well, I know the first thing in the file is the first name, so this is perfectly valid. Right? So then I can say, well, I can go down here and take the rest of this, put it in here, and read these things. Right? So if I've successfully read a first name, then I can read in the last name, the ID, and the grade. And so down here, I can take this student, and then I can add that student. And now I've added everyone in the class. Isn't that so easy? Like, if you have very simple data like this, like, I can't think of an easier way to do this in any other programming language. Now, here's something really interesting. This fin piping operator, do you remember when I did standard C out? So how I could do standard C out, um, I could say name, and then I could pipe in something else, like uh, first. The same thing is true of file reading. So I don't need separate lines for this. I can do the following. F in last ID grade. So look at that. It's like three lines of code to read in that whole file. And now if I save and run, I'm printing out the whole class from that course list. And so this is the way for every assignment that I give you, okay, I am going to be giving you a configuration file. So configuration files for your games are going to store things like font sizes, the window size, how many entities, the different types of assets, etc. This is the way that I want you to read in those config files, okay? If anyone can tell me, uh, a programming language that does this easier, I, I'd be very interesting, very interested in hearing that. Because I think this is like the minimum amount of lines possible to do this in. And it's C++, which is also very fast. Okay, so your config files for the assignments are going, I want you to read, geez, excuse me. I want you to read them in, in the same way. Because this is modern, efficient, fast, safe C++. Now, if I happen to do something like um, let's let's look at students.txt. Now, if I had like uh, like some error in my code, right, and then I write that out, and then I compile and run it again, it's like this isn't good, right? Because what happened is it read in a string into first, which was fine. Then it read in the string 12, then it read in these values and it actually gave me an error because it expected a string in one case and got an integer or expected an integer and got a string. So yes, this is very easy, but of course we haven't done any error handling here, right? If we actually wanted to go in and say, okay, is this a string or is this an int? That would of course be extra code, but we are not at that point quite yet. Okay. so. That is the, the end of today's um, live coding part. There's going to be really fun live coding in the next lecture. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get the PowerPoint slides back up. And I do know that this, like I said, this lecture goes a little bit long. But uh, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure that you have a good intro to, to C++. So it's going to be just a little bit longer, but that's fine. There's no textbook, right? 
Okay, so now that we've seen some live coding, we can actually start to appreciate the separation of CPP and H files. So C++ class code is often separated into two different files. The H file is the header. So that's the header files with the declarations. The CPP file is the implement implementation file with definitions. So again, the declaration of a function might be, okay, this is a function called sum. It takes in two integers and returns an integer, but it doesn't tell you how it's done. The definition is going to be the function signature plus the function definition, which actually does the actual uh, programming part. So why use header files? Well, header files contain the declarations. The declarations include the function name, the return types, the arguments, etc. And it's required by C++ to see all of the classes and functions and variables before they're actually used. And so they serve several useful purposes beyond just the required declarations. So, so here we go. This is this example again. If I have void my function, right? So I have some function in C++ and I want to use my class. So say that was student or course or whatever. As we recall, I cannot define my class down here because it's, it's below my function, right? And so it won't see it. I can define my class up here because it's before my function. So my function will see it. So what I do is I define my class.h which has all of the headers, like, sorry, all of the, um, the declarations. I put that in the header file and then I include it up here. All right. So some of the benefits of header files, this is an example header file that we will be using in this course. This is a class which is vec2. So it's a vector. It's, it's not a vector as in a container. It's a two dimensional mathematical vector. Okay. So vec2 is an X and a Y. It's essentially a point in 2d space. But what a header does is it allows you to see all of your class functionality at a glance, right? So I can look at this header file and without being bogged down by the implementation details, I can look at all the functionality of this class on like one screen, which is super, super important when you start getting into bigger and bigger classes. Um, so this will reduce cognitive load. Uh, cognitive load is like when you're programming, programming, unlike most professions, have you ever been programming an assignment and like, you're like, okay, I'm in my recursive function. The recursive function is in my main loop and the main loop is in the main function. So if I do this thing in a recursive function and like, oh, now I'm like three levels deep in this. And then someone comes, hello, do you want a sandwich? And you're like, you've just lost 20 minutes of your life because you were in this mental state where you had all of these variables and all of this stack all in your, all in your head. And as someone yeah, mentioned, your mental stack completely unwinds and you're gone. So if you're in that stack in your head and you need to be reminded of what a header does, you just want to look, you want everything possible to reduce cognitive load. And that includes things like the way I have formatted this file, right? to be able to see things at a glance and to have those nice columns of, of names and stuff like that. It also separates the design of the class from the functionality of the class. So this is the design of the class. These are the functionalities, oh, sorry. These are the things I want the, the class to be able to do. And then in my CPP file, I am defining how to do what I want to do in the header file. So that again, reduces cognitive load. And the other huge benefit when you get to larger code bases is that 99% of the programming that you do in C++ is in the CPP files because you have thought about your program in advance and you've made all of your header files. So you've, de you've declared how you want things or you've declared the functionality you want your program to to have, that rarely changes. What changes very often is the CPP file, how you actually do those things. So your implementation changes a lot, your design doesn't change a lot. So why does that matter? Well, it matters for compilation times, okay? So if all you're doing is recompiling CPP files, then having them separated 
drastically reduces the amount of time the compiler takes um, for, for specific tasks. Okay, here are some drawbacks of header files. There's more files in your code base, right? It is strictly worse to have more files in your code base than to have, well, that's not true. It's, it's usually worse to have more files than to have more, or to, than to have fewer files. This means you may have more tabbing back and forth between header and CPP files. So some people that I've seen um, between, uh, like on the same screen, they'll have the header file and the CPP file open at once so they can see both. Um, cyclical dependencies can be hard to detect and resolve. We're not going to get too much into cyclical dependencies, but let's say, for example, I have a class course, right? And I have a class student. Well, let's say my, my course needs to, my course header file needs to include student because courses need to know about students. But let's say in the student class, I wanted to store a list of the courses that students were taking. So course includes student and student includes course. And you have an infinite loop of includes and so uh, there's ways to get around that. And C++, that is one of the most annoying things about C++ in practice is these cyclical dependencies. And you have to kind of design around cyclical dependencies because of that. But needless to say, it can happen. It won't happen in this course because I've designed it not to happen. But just keep that in mind. Okay. So here's at a glance what happens in your compilation. You're going to have uh, your source files. So .cpp, .h. Some people use .hpp, um, but we're going to use .h. Uh, all of those CPP and header files get compiled into object files, and then they get linked into an executable program. That's at the top level. Alrighty. Just a couple of more things. Uh, mentioning some C++ primitive types, just like Java, C++ has a bunch of different primitive types. This is just a, a reference. Uh, though we're not going to actually go into this. I don't need to tell you uh, about all this stuff. We're going to talk about um, bit operations that some programming languages do not have, um, but we'll talk about that in the future. Uh, we talked about functions again. Uh, this is the syntax for functions. So we have function name, uh, arguments in brackets or in parentheses, and then a return type. And then uh, we have logic uh, over on the right. So this is very similar to Java and JavaScript, etc. Um, C++ classes, uh, anything not declared is private. Anything that's declared is public. Uh, so for example, here's a constructor. We already talked about that. These are initializer lists. I want you to use initializer lists. This is uh, the destructor, which we talked about that a little bit. Anything you need to clean up, you can do in the destructor. There are some STL containers. We'll be going into this more and more in the class. Um, some of the most commonly used ones are standard vector of T so that it stores a type. We saw how I screwed up with uh, trying to store students in an int vector. Standard set, standard map. You're all familiar with these concepts from other courses, but C++ has all of these in the STL. Um, so some examples, you know, you can have a standard uh, vector of integers. You can uh, use the constructor values of a vector to say, okay, I want this vector to be initialized with four elements, each of the elements being equal to a million, for example. Uh, vectors push back because vectors are a stack in C++. They're also a stack in other languages, but C++ is very explicit about um, pushback. Um, pushback a value, pop, clear, reserve, etc. So here's just, again, these are just slides for a reference. Um, you can go look at these, so you can use iterators if you want. We really won't be using iterators here. Um, you've seen all of this already. Here is some, uh, here's a look at uh, sets. So you should know sets from previous courses. You can add to sets, you can find things in sets, you can erase from sets, you can iterate through sets, etc. Um, and there's also maps, so we can have key value pairs and we can store values based on their key and we can iterate through key value pairs in that way. Okay, so those last slides, we, we already did a bunch of that in the, in the live coding, but I just want them in the slides for you as a reference when you come back. Okie dokie, so that was a bit of a long one. We went an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, if we go back to 
our um, spreadsheet here, we can see that we've got one more. Uh, no, I'm not looking at the spreadsheet, am I? So we've got one more lecture of C++, okay? And then we're going to get in a few more C++ coding examples as well as assignment one. And that's when the course starts getting really fun. And the rest of the course, I promise you, is actually about game programming, okay? Uh, if you want to get a head start with setting that up, I've put uh, some instructions here um, in a text file on the website. So you can start setting things up, but I am not giving out the assignment files yet, okay? You can get C++ um, up and running on Linux, on Mac. You can do uh, some of the examples that are on the SFML tutorials website. Uh, you can install Visual Studio. Um, you can get all that stuff up and running, but I will be going through all of that when I get to A1 as well. Okay, so that is it for today's lecture. It went a little bit long. Uh, the next one will be a little bit shorter, but I just want to make sure that you have all of the best possible um, information that you have on C++ before we start to actually get into the game programming. All right, and I will see you uh, in the next class.